here we are about 45 minutes from Washington, D.C., where the White House is. And we have homes in this condition. And it's so sad, and the part that really gets me for real, you'll see an abandoned house, an abandoned house, an abandoned house, and then one person living there. And then you'll see a whole bunch of abandoned houses. You know, this is not Beirut. This is not a third world country. No. No one should have to live like that. For example, that someone lives right there. Mm. Next to somewhere where a dead body could be in this house right now. You can drive at night during any weekend. And if you drive around enough, you will see yellow tape at some point. And we all know what the yellow tape means. When the yellow tape come out, that means that somebody is dead. We need to be able to have people come out and celebrate positive things, the good victim, things. He has now disconnected. Baltimore has a problem with killing and murder. It has a problem with drug abuse. It has a problem with gangs. Some of the poverty areas in the city have not changed for decades, uh, particularly where the riots were in the Montgomery area. That has been a poverty-stricken area for generations. And it's not changing. Uh, it needs to change. Uh, we'd like it to change. So far, we have not broken that cycle of poverty and crime and really desperation in those areas. And I think uh, in particular of the street gangs, the organized gangs that are down there, uh, they don't want to see these people escape that kind of poverty. They want to keep them in there. So you meet those people too. If the ministry you're doing starts to hamper drug sales, they're going to come after anybody that does that. It can be anything from a threatening letter, uh, sometimes a bullet is left in your mailbox or you know, on your front porch. That's, uh, that says that uh, the next bullet you won't hear, it'll just hit you. It's hard to convince a young man to, uh, to continue in high school and to get a job at one of our fast food restaurants and make minimum wage when he can be recruited by a gang and sell drugs and make hundreds of dollars a day. Selling drugs is an addiction, and the addiction is how fast you make money. You got accustomed to your lifestyle, and for whatever reason you're not making that no more, you're gonna be depressed. So when a person sells drugs for 10 years, he makes a lot of money. And if he don't have the know-how to transfer that energy and to find the same job that's equivalent to that lifestyle, he's going to fail. See, in America, you can be whatever you want to be. You know, you can go to jail on Monday, get out of jail, and go to college. That's just how America is. But you got to want to do it. They're not going, you know, take you by your hand and say, oh, come on. Me, personally, there's only two jobs I would do that's equivalent to the lifestyle that I had barbering and driving tractor trucks. So if I couldn't be a barber, I'd drive tractor trucks. I'd always wanted to be a lawyer. Criminal defense was quite attractive to me for a number of reasons. I grew up watching TV shows about criminal defense lawyers. I was born and raised here. I went off to school. I came back. So therefore, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a natural fit for me. It's my hometown. I'm a criminal defense attorney. 
um, and there's a fair share of crime here. I've represented thousands of people that charge with all types of offenses. This systemic problem is all over. Drugs, money going hand in hand. Uh, you've got um, a marginalized community of, of poor people who see no other way to come across substantial monies, and so they find themselves involved in narcotics. There's not much of a future. Most of them will end up in prison, in and out of prison, and back to the neighborhood, in prison, back to the neighborhood. That'll be their existence. And so you have a group of people who are unemployable. They have no job, no income. And those are the ones that find themselves mired in the criminal justice system. You know, the criminal justice system is locking up more and more people. And once you get a criminal record, then you can be discriminated against legally. In housing, so it means it keeps everybody there because they can't find housing somewhere else because they have a criminal record. So they keep them locked in that community. Um, they can't find jobs because of the criminal record, so they don't have the money to move out of that community anyway. And it's, a, it's an ugly picture, but it is the carnage um, that, we, that we see you know, more and more and more. But I just see it as getting, getting worse in that pocket of individuals, and so we're gonna build more prisons. That's really been the solution. Build more prisons, um, and, that's, and that's what's going to continue. The life of uh, American black people in general is um, we're still behind everyone else. If the average white family controls $800,000, just say, well, the average African American would control twenty dollars or $30,000. We're filling up the prisons. The life is the same. It's, there's, there's been no change. Two weeks ago, when I was in California, you know, these riot squad with rifles and everything, they arrested me in the masjid. They said, you're trespassing. And I've been there for 40 years. <laughs> I went to jail. I came out. I went back to the, the place. They came right back. So last, two months ago, I went to jail twice. We're not revolutionaries running around with guns here in America. Nonviolent resistance for us is transformation. You have to have a revolution in the mind. If you don't want to make a new world, you have to make new people. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. The CIA is here, the FBI, all these people are here. Washington, D.C. is the capital, the center of criminality, the center of oppression. That is my reason for coming here to Washington, D.C. I would learn all the processes and methodologies that they use against the people. They have a general policy here in America. Number one, if you stand up and try to change, they'll say, join us. You could have what you want in the system. They try to bribe you. Just join us, it's okay. If you don't do that, then they'll try to scare you. If you don't shut up, if you don't join us, we're gonna take your house, your family, your car. We're gonna take your job. We're gonna do all of that. You can't rent anywhere from anybody. If you're a movie star, we're gonna tell the people in Hollywood, if you put him on, we're gonna check your taxes. We're gonna do all of that. So they leave you alone, right? The government was so skillful that it destroyed the real movements. It imprisoned people. When you step outside of these doors, you must realize that you are fighting a war a war against 400 years of racism. America doesn't care about poor people until they ask for something, like give me rights, give me justice. A lot of folks might need health care. No, that's, that's, that's when they respond. They don't respond to police violence, but they respond to the way we protest. It's so hypocritical. I think uh, a lot of these communities like St. Louis, like Baltimore, 
even the South Bronx, we're so poor. This is by design. Like, you'd better believe that institutional racism and oppression and capitalism are real elements that play into our impoverished and hopeless state. There's a reason why our schools are failing. There's a reason why our kids are allowed to drop out. No one wants us to climb up the food chain. During the riots a couple of years ago, uh, a young man was interviewed as to why he participated in the riots and why he participated in the looting. Uh, he was 17 years old and quite frankly said, I expect to be dead in a couple of years, so why not? That was somebody without hope. For people that are living in the poverty areas, it is hard to uh, maintain hope. The heart has already been eaten out of America. Part of America that they used to call the core of America, uh, farming white people and small communities all in the hills and mountains, they don't exist anymore. We believe that the churches, the mosque like this, should solve the social problems. That's what we're working on. This was all dilapidated. Actually, uh, it was a junkyard, and it was tied. This whole area where our church is is tied for the highest crime area in this city right here. But what we did was we believed that our life in Christ should also be exemplified in the community. So what we did was we started our own community development corporation, and we started this, and look at it. This, we, we named it Paradise Manor because uh, we didn't have the money, but we had God, we had his word, we said he's given us the power, and we've uh, built this whole community and neighborhood. Actually now we've built over 400 homes through our CDC, and this is just a part of what our church has done. Every white person wasn't a slave owner, <laughs> okay? Every white person didn't have a slave, you know, weren't a plantation owners. There was plenty of white people who weren't prospering too. They didn't have money. It's not about color. It's just the fact that uh, the African slaves that came over here, fortunately, we had some white people who said that that's wrong, it's sin. The abolitionists, they, they preached against slavery. We had, for the first time in history, a country say slavery is wrong. And that presented a problem for those who had slaves because it's about money, it's about power. The Civil War here in America really wasn't about color, it was about money, <laughs> you know? So that's what it was all about. You're messing with people's money, but they're really in a fight over it. But what I'm saying is that the whole racist message, certainly, you know, there are people who uh, resented black people because, hey, you know, you're free now, you used to work for me, and uh, I don't like you. I mean, that's just, uh, um, inner problem you know if everybody was the same color we'd find something the short would be against the tall the fat versus the skinny whatever it's an inward problem see so what i'm saying is that today the message to white people today is uh you know you're a racist <laughs> you're a racist you say anything about a black person you're a racist what's happened today is that our country has become divided and you know a house divided won't stand <laughs> okay so Racism has become a political pawn. The system has organized an oppressive system against the black community. Slavery was legal in this country. Slavery still exists here. The Democratic Party uses it to keep black people voting for them. Those Republicans are racist, but actually it's the Democratic platform that basically is what I call the slave master today. Meaning what? We're going to provide for you. We're going to be the ones who help you. We'll give you this, we'll give you that, we'll give you this. What is that? It's just to keep control over them. And the uh, words that are being said to black people is that, well, you know, you're, you live in a white supremacist country, and because you're black, you can't do this and you can't have that. That's a lie. Street, 
you know, we're an entertaining group. <laughs> so the cameras do come. The cameras came during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, the cameras uh, will continue to come. Um, because you kick up enough dust, cameras are gonna come because it's good television and it's exciting. It's a white world, white power structure, white people run everything. Um, they control the media, black people don't. And a part of the white power structure here in the United States is to keep us as second class citizens. I was born in 1963, so um, the Voting Rights Act, I believe was in 1968 with the Civil Rights Act. And uh, black men had a right to vote. So discrimination became illegal back in the 1960s. So they had to find other trick ways in order to keep us mentally enslaved. They have to keep racism out there because that's how they keep the black vote. They keep the black vote by saying those other people are racist and remember what they did to you. So what it does is it keeps us bitter, keeps black people focused on the negative stuff that happened versus what we need to do and be as a people in a land of opportunity and freedom. See, so it's propaganda. It's a device, it's a tool that's used to keep people's vote. Voted against the president, right? We had to remember that the Democrats won the popular vote. It's the system that is built controlling people of color and poor people. They've never apologized for racism. The biggest terror threat in this country is white men. The greatest division in our country, in my opinion, is the political division. You see, between the Democrats and the Republicans. They're looking at the next election. They're trying to find something and say things about the next election so that uh, they can win. You know, just like with Russia. Oh, he's Russian this and the Russian this and the, I mean, it's all, you know. And I just believe right now that, that more blacks are coming to the realization that uh, the Democratic Party can't control us anymore like they've done in the past. Listen, racism has become a political game that's played by politicians. Racism exists, but racism really doesn't matter. Discrimination does. All around this area, it's kind of like expensive to live. In this area, not in the lower class, not like in Mayfield or Crowfoot Bottom or in the projects. No money, cost of living, economy. It's a lot of racism, all right. and it continues to go on at all times. It's gonna continue to go, you can't stop that. When white people was coming up here, they used to sell, they got a stone or block over there on Charles Street where they used to sell my people. You know, different than the Mexicans who here. The Mexicans, they're another, they have a unit, but they work just as hard for a little or nothing. They make less than we do. Yeah. But they work together. They are first class unity people. They take a little or something and make a lot. We, as a black people, we don't never have no unity nowhere. All because of greed or scared that someone's gonna have more than what you have. Another war. That's what I think. It can lead to another war. They do not want black people to be equal. They might want one black friend or they want one black famous person. They want one black this and one black that, you see? And after they have that, they don't want any more. So it's the illusion of not being racist, but is it the true way of not being racist? There's been no real improvement. Just because we have black mayors, just because we have black senators, just because we have black congressmen, that doesn't mean anything for the people. 
do you know more people got killed, black people got killed during Obama's time than they do in anybody else's time? Because you have a black president, you can't say it's not good, right? All the symptoms of decline. Schools are closing. America had the best education system in the world. Now it's down. The American transportation system, highway system, used to be the best in the world. It's falling apart. The American economy used to control the worldwide economy. Now America's economy is crumbling. We hadn't experienced anything like this since the Great Depression. Since 2008, our communities have been in ruins. We haven't seen this kind of loss of wealth in black America since the collapse of the Freedmen's Bank. For 240 years, our nation's call to citizenship has given work and purpose to each new generation. America is a better, stronger place than it was when we started. After all, we remain the wealthiest, most powerful, and most respected nation on Earth. Our youth, our drive, our diversity and openness, our boundless capacity for risk and reinvention means that the future should be ours. The people in America have already lost hope. They've already lost hope but they haven't lost the kind of hope to rebel. <laughs> <laughs>